Amen. What's up, church? We're doing good? You guys take a seat. Take a seat. Welcome, welcome. My name is Ryan. Uh, if we haven't met yet, I'd love to meet you after service. Um, man, Sunday nights, we, we live for Sunday nights. We, we love that we get to come together and worship and sing and open this book and ask the Holy Spirit to, to help us and to teach us. And um, man, we've been believing all week that, that tonight, that in the next few moments as we uh, just talk a little bit about who Jesus is and, and, and worship God, uh, that, that, that God would set us free a little bit more tonight, that we would walk out of here changed. And uh, I believe that's going to happen because I get to end uh, the, this series, Elements, with our, our fourth and final element, and, and the element is wind. So, so, wind is important because wind actually appears in the first page of the Bible. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and, and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, right? Right from the very beginning, the Spirit of God. Well, that word spirit is actually the, the Hebrew word ruach. Everyone say ruach. Say you got to clear your throat at the end of it. Ruach. Ruach is the word for spirit, but that word also means breath of God. And it also means wind. So right from the very beginning, from the, the beginning of all of this, the wind, the breath of God, the spirit has been taking disorder and creating, creating something beautiful from the chaos, right? It's been taking, it's been taking the brokenness and it's been, been creating beauty. And so tonight we're talking uh, about wind, about the ruach, uh, about the very spirit of God because tonight is all about surrendering. Learning to surrender to what God is doing in our lives. And I know that word's a little scary, and I know it's a little hard. Trust me, I know, because as soon as uh, we kind of planned this whole series out, and I decided to, to do the last week, I knew the story that I had to tell. And this isn't a cool story. Uh, it's not going to make me look very cool, and you guys already know that that's, that's a problem already. And so I don't want to tell this story, but I know that I have to. So here goes September 9th. 2015. Think back to 2015. September 9, 2015, where were you? <laughs> I, I was in California. Um, I, I woke up about 7 a.m. and um, I had my quiet time which is the, the Christian way of saying I read the Bible and prayed, and we just cannot think of a cooler way to say that. So we say quiet time, but I was, I was having my quiet time, and then I made a healthy breakfast, just the egg whites, right? Not, not the bad stuff. I'm not even on like Whole30 at the time. I'm just, I'm just like, man, I need to be eating healthy. I'm taking like my multivitamins. I'm drinking enough water. Everything is good. I get, to, get in my car. I go to work. I'm working at a great church in California at the time, and uh, it's a Wednesday, and so on Wednesdays I meet with people, and so I have just, just meetings lined up, one after the next, um, like top of the hour type of a thing, and so one by one people come through and they just have questions about God or about um, life or about whatever, and you guys, I am like on fire September 9th, 2015, like any question anybody has, I'm just like pulling out answers from everywhere and I'm using like, like Hebrew words because it makes you sound so cool and I like have books on my bookshelf to like hand to people like, hey, by the way, you should read this book. It'll really change your life and I'm like sending people out and people are crying, you know, and that's how you know it's a, it's a good like meeting and so I'm just crushing it and then I get in my car. And I go to seminary. Uh, I was like a year into to working uh, on my, my master's degree, just going once a week. And, and I was so thirsty for knowledge and, and to learn more about God. So I was like the front row guy, right, with the, with the journal out and the coffee ready to go. And I was responding. And I was, I was learning all these things and, and getting straight A's. I was doing everything right. I get in my car, I drive home. I have just enough time to, to get to the beach for the sunset. And uh, I, I, I love to surf. Um, for me, it's less surfing and more sitting out in the water. Um, but I like to, to sit in the water, and so don't judge me. It's just what I, I like to do. And um, I, I get out there, and I remember the, the wind starting to pick up 
because that's what, what happens in, in California. Which, by the way, if you're thinking about proposing to your, your girlfriend on the beach at sunset, I know it sounds romantic, but trust me, the wind will pick up, and you'll spend most of your time just trying to, like, hold the tablecloth on the table right? when you're trying to do everything else. Just That's a side note. Um, but I get there, and the, the wind's blowing, and, and the sun's going down, and I jump into the water. I'm paddling out after having had done, like, everything right, crushing it all day feeling like, man, I finally got this pastor thing on lockdown, you know? And I distinctly remember coming up over this wave and uh, come up over the wave and the sun's going down, the wind's in my face. I get to the bottom of the wave and I just start crying, like ugly cry type of cry. And I don't do that. Ask Brian. I'm not a very emotional human being. And so crying is like a, a, a hard thing for me. And out of nowhere, you guys, I just lose it. Like the seagulls are flying by looking at me like, what's wrong with that human? Are you okay? Like chill, chill out, man. And, and I'm like so glad nobody else is around because I am, am like shaking uncontrollably crying. And the crazy thing is I have no idea why. Like have you ever been in a season where you're doing everything right and yet something's wrong. It's, it's easy. Um, it's like easier to know what's, what's, what's going on when, when you're in a season where you're not doing everything right and everything's wrong. And you're like, yeah, well, I know. I know why. But when you're like following all of the steps and yet something is still off, it can be a very confusing moment. Four years ago, I had no idea why, why I was crying in the water. But, but today, I do know why. And uh, throughout the course of this message... I want to do my best to communicate why that is because I think that the reason uh, will have a direct impact on not only my week but your week this week and that if we can wrestle with and sit with this, this truth that's found in God's word, it's going to set us free as we leave this place. So my message is called Catch the Wind. Turn to your neighbor and say, Catch the Wind. Catch the Wind. Lord, we love you so much. God, I thank you for this place. I thank you for this space. As we open up your word, would you be here with us? And spirit, I pray that you would change lives tonight. I pray that you would teach us how to surrender. In the name of Jesus, everyone said amen. We ready to go? Feeling good? Some of you are looking at me like, are you going to start crying again on stage? What's, what's, what's the deal? No, maybe. We'll see. We'll get there. Go to uh, John 3 if you have your Bibles. If anybody needs a Bible, we have plenty for you. Um, if you need to just take home a Bible, those are, are a gift to you. Please have a Bible. Read, read the Gospel of John this week. We're just reading uh, one short part of it. But go back and read the whole thing um, because it will change your life. John chapter 3. So the next uh, few minutes of, of this talk, I, I, I know we, we love to preach, and we love to yell, and we love to, to go for it. Um, also, I want to teach a little bit for a few minutes, because there's, there's a, a truth in John 3 that's been, been on my heart for the last few weeks, and I think uh, if, if we teach a little bit, it'll give us something to, to yell about later, right? And it'll give us something to get excited about when we worship a little later. So I know this is going to feel a little teachy, and you're like, bro, it's summertime, what are we doing? Stick with me for a few minutes. And then we'll get practical. John chapter 3 is where we meet this man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, it says this, John chapter 3 verse 1. Now there is a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So our boy Nicodemus is a Pharisee. What that means is he was a part of this religious order that saw themselves as the, the separated ones. In fact, that's what the name Pharisee means, separated ones. And what they would do is they would all get together and they would go, hey, we're going to be the ones that, that follow God's law like to a T. There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. And uh, over time, this oral tradition had, had been built up called the Mishnah, where we had added, they had added 1,500 extra laws to those 613. So they're like, like, 613 is not enough. We need to add 1,500 more, and we're going to stick to all of these. They're like the, the remember the kids back in the day in summer vacation who would, like, want to play school? 
Like, like, like you'd be like, hey, what should we do? Should we play baseball? Should we play football? Should we play a video game? And someone's like, what if I create an assignment for you guys, and then you guys do the assignment, and then I'll grade it? You know, and you're like, what? I didn't, why, why are we trying to do that? This is the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the ones who are like, like man, we're going we're gonna to do everything the right way. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, but not only that, says he's a member of the Jewish ruling council. It's called the Sanhedrin. Uh, a group of, of 71 uh, people who really call all the shots and, and get to make all the final decisions. And to, to be a part of that Jewish ruling council, you have to be like the cream of the crop. So not only is Nicodemus a, a Pharisee, which is already hard enough, he's also like one of the top dogs within the Pharisees. Nicodemus, in other words, is a guy who has done everything right. But it's possible that you can be doing everything right and yet something is still wrong, all right? So let's keep going. Verse 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Underline that word night if you write in your Bibles. If that's weird, whatever. Remember when, when Ethan just started preaching about Harry Potter for no reason? Sorry about that. <laughs> and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Okay, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. What's going on here? In my mind, when I think about it, I think we've got a guy, Pharisee, devoted his entire life to trying to understand God. And then he sees this guy, Jesus, this carpenter, this this. Uh, Man who comes on the scene and walks around with this freedom that Nicodemus has been trying to find his entire life. And I think Nicodemus is, is laying in his bed, restless, trying to figure out what Jesus has that, that he doesn't. And so he's like, man, I got to go. I got to go talk to this guy. I got to go. And by the way, it makes sense that he would go at night um, because if you really love the power and the prestige that your religious system allows you. Like Pharisees were, were the guys, you know. Everyone had to listen to the Pharisees. And if you really like the power and the prestige that your religious system allows you, a guy coming on the scene going, hey, you want to be great? Learn how to serve. That's like, that's really threatening to you, right? If you really like the power and prestige that your religious system uh, allows you and some guy comes on the scene going, if you want to you be first, Learn how to be last. Like that's threatening to the very system that you are trying to create. And that's what Jesus has been doing. Or, or how about this? If you love the power and prestige that your religious system is allowing you and somebody comes on the scene and starts hanging out with all the fringe people, right? with, with the tax collectors, with the sinners, with the ones, with the lepers, with the ones that, that we say are unclean and should be out there. And this Jesus guy comes on the scene and goes, those are my people. Those are my people. I'm, a, I'm an Imago Dei guy. I'm an image of guy, God guy. I'm, I'm a, we see everybody as a human being with inherent value. If you love being the guy, then that is kind of threatening to you, right? And so Nicodemus is coming at night going, hey, I, don't, I feel like, like I can't really let my buddies know that I'm here, but I got to ask, Jesus. I got to ask, like, he doesn't even ask the question. He goes, I'm, I'm here, and, like, I know that, like, God's working through you, but I just, like, what's the deal, Jesus? What's the, what do you have that I don't have? Jesus responds, verse 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Because who needs small talk? <laughs> Jesus is just like, hey, you're here. It's nighttime. You, you got these questions. Then le let's go. He goes, hey, Nicodemus, um, you know how you've spent your entire life trying to do the right thing always, all the time? What if we tried this? What if we tried throwing all of that out? What if the entire system was broken? What if, what if our father was less interested in you following the rules and more interested in having a relationship with you? What if God was more interested in, in, in us not going, hey, I'm going to try to control God by putting God into my debt, by doing all these good things so that God has to, like he owes me? What if, what if, what if uh, God's more interested in us throwing all that out and going, hey, um, I'm here 
I'm, I'm a broken human being, but I'm, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to love. I'm ready to, to, to help people. What if, Nicodemus, everything you've worked for your entire life, what if we just threw it out? What if we just threw it out and you, and you had an opportunity to, to be born again and to try again? It's a beautiful invitation to, to put down religion and pick up a relationship with God. Because, by the way, Jesus, as he's walking around uh, and starting this, this movement, he's walking up to his disciples like Peter and Andrew and James and those guys. And what's he saying? Hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, so here's the list of rules that I want you to follow. Right? No. No. Hey, we're doing something new. Follow me. Not follow all these rules. Follow me. Like, like let's go live life together. right? And, and yeah, we're going to go do some cool things. We're going to heal people. We're going to set the captives free. And we're going to preach the gospel. But we're also going to like eat meals. You know, like we're also going to have like great nights where we just hang out and tell stories. We're also going to be human beings just being in relationship with one another. So the reason we do all of the, the community things that we do is because we want to be not just a church that comes together on, on Sunday nights, but a family that lives life together. Right? We, we have life groups because we want to be a, a family that's together and sharing meals and doing life and, and learning how to be representations of, of, of God in Austin. We just get it from Jesus. And, and Jesus gives Nicodemus the invitation here in verse 3. And let's watch how Nicodemus responds. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Talk about like, like type A guy, right? Okay, you, you gave me 613 laws. Give me one more. Give me a 614th and I'll go keep it right now. I'll go keep it right now. And Jesus goes, uh, how about being born again? How about throwing all of that out and, and entering into a relationship? And all he can think is, hey, I don't think like the physics of that is, is possible, right? And Jesus is like, no, you, like, you're, you're, you're missing it. I'm not talking like literal here. Like, 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 like Nicodemus, come on. So Peter, or Jesus says this. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Now, it might sound like a bit of an odd response for us here in 2019. Uh, but Jesus was well aware of who he was talking to. See, the man he was talking to was an Old Testament scholar. What we now call the Old Testament, he had memorized. He, he Nicodemus, knew, knew the Old Testament inside and out. And what Jesus just did, I know it's hard for us to see, Jesus just quoted Ezekiel 36:25. And, and he just told a story, or, or Ezekiel 36, 25 is this, this prophet that comes on the scene like 600 years earlier um, when the whole, that, that, that first system of, hey, keep all the rules and we'll be good called religion had just completely failed the people of God. Ezekiel comes on the scene and in, in Ezekiel 36, 37, he starts prophesying. He starts, he starts talking about a brand new way to understand God, a brand new way to do this whole thing where the spirit of God comes and breathes, Ruach comes and breathes new life into us. And so he allows us to stop trying to control everything with religion and start learning how to just surrender and trust God. Now, we read that and we go, wait. What, but if Nicodemus, if we could be a fly on the wall and watch Nicodemus have this interaction with Jesus, his eyes must have been like the size of golf balls. He had, must have had like Princess Jasmine eyes as he's like, like, wait, what? I, she has big eyes if you look at it in the cartoon. That's, that was a random, I don't know. I observe weird things. Nicodemus had to be so shocked. So surprised because what Jesus is saying is, hey, um, you know all of this story that you're an expert on? It all points to me. Like there's a new way to do all of this, Nicodemus, and, it, and, and, and the, only, uh, the only thing you need to do is, is not keep all the rules. The only thing you need to do is just surrender and, and start trusting that, that God is in control and that his spirit, his breath, his ruach, the wind is going to, to be okay, and we don't have to try to control the wind. 
We can just, like any, any person on a sailboat, we can just put our sails up and try to catch the wind. Just be a part of what God is doing. In fact, he says it like this. Let's keep going. You should not be surprised at me saying you must be born again. Listen to this. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The wind blows where it pleases. You say, Nicodemus, you've tried your entire life, your entire life to, to please this God, right? You've tried your entire life to do everything right, to play the game so that God would bless you. Could I maybe just tell you that the wind uh, is going to blow wherever it pleases, so trying to control the wind is a fool's game? Right, the wind blows wherever it, it pleases. God's up to something in this world. So what if, what if we dropped the religion and we picked up a relationship? Right? And, and, and um, the, all across this room, I'm sure there's people in lots of different life stages. Like some of you have been following Jesus for 30 years. Some of you for three years. Some of you for three months. Some of you for three days. Some of you are, are here trying to figure this whole thing out. No matter where you are, no matter uh, uh, what part of your, your life journey you're in, you are so welcome here. We're so glad that you're here. But surrender is one of those things that, that we all, it doesn't matter where you are or, or, or what you believe, surrender is this daily practice that if we will try, if we will start like, like, like putting it into our daily routine, it will take us somewhere. Because you can have control or you can have growth. But you can't have both. You can have control of your life, or you can grow in your relationship with God, but you can't have both. Nicodemus is being asked to let go of, of, of the control, let go of the reins, and he has to just be terrified. And in fact, we know that he is. In verse 9, he says, how can this be? <laughs> I used to read that and just be like, well, Nicodemus, like, you, you're trying to figure it out intellectually. No, he was a smart guy. He knew what Jesus was saying. It's just that this was so new, and it was so fresh, and it was so radical, and it was so subversive that Nicodemus can't keep it all in. He's like, like man, I can't understand all this. How can this be? I love Jesus' response, by the way. Wait, you're Israel's teacher? Like, you're supposed to be the guy that gets all this, and you don't, you don't understand these things? Because maybe at some level... Following Jesus is more than an intellectual ascent. And hey, I'm a, I'm a five on the Enneagram. Like Nicodemus, I think, was a five as well. Uh, we're, we're the ones that, that like to investigate everything and think that we can just think our way out of things. Nicodemus is, is learning in this moment that he can't think his way out of this one. That the life, the freedom that he's actually searching for is not found in, in, in cracking the code, but in surrender. That he can't control the ruach, the wind. But he can, if he chooses, put his sail up and be a part of what the wind is doing. Maybe it's time we stop trying to control the wind and start learning to catch the wind. Because I'll tell you this. One of those things is exhausting. The other is exhilarating. So let's talk about you. Let's talk about what this means for you. Like, like what would it look like for you to surrender the dreams that God has placed in your heart? The goals, the things that you aspire to do, your calling, the, the things you feel like God placed you on this earth to do. What would it look like to, to, to surrender those things. Uh, I think we make two mistakes here. I, I think on one side of the equation, the first mistake we make is I'll, I'll hear, like, somebody will come up to me like, hey, quit my job. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, I just didn't feel, didn't feel like it was the right fit, didn't feel like it's where I was going, so I, I quit. Like, great, I, I respect that, so, like, what's, what's the plan? Oh, I, I don't have one. You, okay, so, like, you were out all day, like, like, handing your resume places and knocking on doors and sending emails and following up with people, right? No. No. Uh, 
surrender, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And it's like, hey, that's not, we need to be careful that, that, that we're not confusing surrender with laziness, you know. Uh, if, if, if the goal is to catch the wind, you got to put the sail up. You got to give the Ruach something to do, something to grab a hold on, right? We, we, we got to be taking proactive steps. And so surrender is not laziness. Surrender is, is, is not uh, deciding not to do things. It's not inactivity. It's not passive. Surrender. What about this? What if we practice? What if we practice active surrender this week? That makes sense. Practice active surrender this week. So on the other side of the equation, if that side is laziness, I, I think the other mistake we make when it comes to surrendering our, our dreams, our future, our calling, our, our whatever you want to put into that category, is we, uh, we, we still at some level want to control the situation, so we want to hear the entire plan before we're even ready to take a first step, Right? Like, like we want the whole, God, give me the whole thing. Give me steps one through a hundred and then I'll start working on step one. And I just feel like, like that's just not how God works. And it's a good thing that's not how God works because if it was, if he gave me everything right up front, I'd figure out a way to ruin it. I'd figure out a way to mess it up. It's like this. Let's say that after service, uh, we're, we want to go to Easy Tiger down the street <clears throat> to, to hang out. Right, and, and maybe maybe you have no idea where Easy Tiger is, and so you go, hey Ryan, would would you like cruise with me, and, and and you can show me how to get there, and I'm like, yeah, it's 2019, you can just put it in your phone, but fine, whatever, whatever. for the sake of the metaphor, forget about that, <laughs> suspend that belief, uh, and we get into your car, and you go, okay, Easy Tiger, how do I get there, and I go, I I mean, take a left on Lamar. Uh, we'll, we'll go from there, and you go, no, 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 no. I'm not turning this car on until you tell me how to get to Easy Tiger. And I'm like, I, I just told you, like, we're, we're going that way. I want to know the whole thing. So you're like, uh, well, you take a left on Lamar, you head up there. You take a right on, on Holden, and then a left on Airport Boulevard, and then a right on, on Highland Mall, and you got to go around that one thing and make sure you don't get onto the frontage road or, the, or, or 35 because then you'll have to go all the way back around, and it's super hard. Right? And make sure you like, park on the north side because that's where all the spots are. And then, and then we'll walk in, and, and then you go, yeah, like, so when you get there, do you think you're going to do, like, cheeseburger or, like, hot wings, all right? And, like, at some point, I'm going to go, hey, why don't we, like, turn the car on, <laughs> you know? Why don't we put the car in drive? Why don't we start taking a few steps? Like, why don't we figure it out as we go, all right? Like, 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 how about this? God can't steer a parked car. Can't. Like, like, like we need to be taking steps or to use our, our sailboat uh, analogy, we need to put the sails up. We need to put the sails up for the wind to be able to catch the wind. I, I feel like if you're anything like me, I, I sometimes uh, want to control. I've got control issues and want to like control my dreams and my calling and all these things God's calling me to do because if I'm being honest, I'm, I'm scared. Right? So I'm like, hey, just give me the whole thing, and then, and then I'll figure it out as we go. The funny thing is, uh, like, if you would have asked Doug or Ethan or I back in 2012, like, hey, what's next for you guys? We would have said without any hesitation, we're planting a church. It's going to be amazing. Going to change the world. Going to change the way we do church. It's going to be it's going to be a revival. It's going to be like a walking revival everywhere we go. Ethan made a business plan for it. Like like we had everything together. The problem is like we didn't even know how to keep a budget. You know? We each had like one sermon. We actually, we were traveling, so every day we'd be with different people, so we would just repeat the same sermons. So we used to bet, we used to make bets uh, about like, like Ethan would be going up, and I'd be like, Doug, I bet I know, I bet I know where exactly where Ethan's going. And, and we'd like make wagers, but we were sharing money because we, we were traveling. So the only thing we had was, was, was push-ups. So we would bet push-ups. Like 60 push-ups says he'll do uh, Stephen praying for Saul before he's persecuted, and then I would always win. A lot, of, a lot of side tangents, I'm sorry. Focus. We had no idea how to plant a church, man. We had the passion, we had the zeal, we had the dream, 
We had the desire to do it, but God was like, okay, great. I love where we're heading, but we need to start taking some baby steps right now, right? Like you go to that church over there, you go to that church over there, you go to that church over there, and we started getting um, jobs like within church and started being pastors and in, in, like having a, a piece of the pie before we had the, the whole thing, right? And we started learning how to, how, to, how to sit with people and how to cry with people and how to do funerals and how to do weddings, like all the, very, all the nuts and bolts that you don't think about. We had to go through a long stage of learning how to do all those things. And can I encourage someone tonight? That's not a bad stage. It's a part of it, right? Like enjoy the process. Put your sails up, catch the wind, and enjoy as you go. So surrendering our dreams looks a lot like being proactive, what about like surrendering our, our image, surrendering what, what, what people think about us? Is that, is that a tough one for anybody but me, right? This is like, man, this is, this is, this is where the rubber hits the road in, in a lot of ways. Um, we, I, am often obsessed with, well, I wonder what, what he thinks about me. I wonder what she thinks about me. I wonder if they like the sermon, you know? Like I wonder if, I wonder if I'm doing a good job. I wonder if I'm doing enough. I wonder if he thinks I'm lazy. All those, all those questions that, that we think about as we lay our head down uh, on the pillow. And yet I think that, that Jesus is giving such a beautiful invitation here to go, hey, what if we just threw out all of that? What if born again was a radical invitation to go, I'm a son or I'm a daughter and the creator of the universe is crazy about me. And so you know what? If somebody doesn't like me or somebody thinks whatever about me, that's fine. That's fine. I know who I am. I know who my, my father is. I know what my identity is. And so from that, I'm going to take steps into this world. That's what I think starts happening in Nicodemus' life after John 3. Let me show you. Flip over to John chapter 7. <clears throat> We always think uh, Nicodemus just appears for one story and then, and then disappears, but it's not true. He actually appears three times in John's gospel. The second time is in John chapter 7, and uh, Jesus is, is doing, doing his Jesus thing and making a lot of people angry, and, and uh, he's, he's like subverting an entire system, and so Nicodemus and his buddies, all the Pharisees, are trying to, they're like meeting and trying to figure out a way to stop it, and, and you know how... Like when you get around your, your, your people, everybody starts throwing out their opinions. It gets really hard to like have your own voice because you just want to like, well, it's easier if I just kind of just fit in with what everybody's saying. Well, I, I feel like Nicodemus is tempted to do that here. But in John chapter 7, he speaks up. John 7 verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was, which we just read, and who was one of their own, asked, wait, does our law condemn a man without first hearing, hearing him to find out what he has been doing? Nicodemus is going, hey, let's pump the brakes for a second. Maybe this Jesus guy is actually on to something. Maybe this Jesus guy is playing a, a whole different game, and maybe there's something to that game. Do you see it in Nicodemus? He's starting to ask questions. He, he's starting to deconstruct some things. He's starting to realize that, hey, maybe God is even more beautiful than we ever knew. Maybe God is even more loving than we ever knew. Maybe God's grace is even better than we ever could think. And, and if you keep reading, his buddies are like, oh, that's not safe. You can't ask those questions. Right? There's no room for that here. We're trying to control these people, not set them free. It's interesting what starts to happen when we start to get a glimpse into God's love for us, isn't it? Like we move from being somebody that, that is, is always thinking, uh, man, I... I feel like God's going to condemn me, and so I'm kind of nervous, and I'm kind of scared, and i got to follow all these rules, too. No, I think God loves me. And I think from there, I'm freed up to now go share that love with other people. Uh, there's a guy named Henry Nowen, who's one of, one of the best minds, I think, um, of, of like the 20th century. And he, he was looking at a painting of the return of the prodigal son. And he was just staring at it, meditating on it. And he looks at his buddy and he goes, hey, uh, 
I think the father welcomed the prodigal son home because he wanted to teach the son how to love other people. Like, I... I think that what the father's trying to do is he's trying to go, hey, son, uh, you're about to face a cruel world where people are going to be mean and people are going to be hurtful and people aren't always going to say nice things to you. I want you to see how much I love you so that you can turn around and show that same love to the entire world. So, so if we go back to John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, sorry, I'm, I'm messing you guys up. John 3, 16 and 17, Jesus goes, for God so loved the world. So he's telling Nicodemus, hey, God loved you so much that he gave his son. Whoever believes won't perish but have eternal life. For he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. Tell me somebody that needs to hear that more than Nicodemus. Hey, God's not trying to condemn you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to save you. I'm not here to condemn you. We've got something so much bigger going on. The good news is even better than you ever knew, man. And uh, I know... uh, that, that this whole faith journey thing comes with, with a lot. And uh, I know there are people in this room right now who are trying to catch the wind. And if you're honest, you would say, man, John 7, Nicodemus resonates with me a lot. Like, I have a lot of questions. I, I have a lot of things I, I'm trying to figure out. Can I, can I just say this? Um, the gospel is big enough for your questions. I promise. This place is big enough for you, you are welcome to bring your questions to the table. For whatever reason, we, we built up this, this faith of like, hey, I know you have all these things that you don't like, but, but just don't talk about it, you know? Let's just, can we move past that? All right? Okay. I, I went to seminary years ago thinking I was going to walk across the stage and graduate to certainty. I wanted to be a ma- master in theology. Even the, t- even the title, I don't like Master, master God. Like once I, once I get that degree, can I tell you I, I ended up walking across the stage and the thing in the back of my mind was, hey, I didn't just graduate to certainty. I graduated from certainty. I'm just well aware that there is so much that I don't know and that I don't understand, but I'm excited to put my sail up and keep catching the wind and keep learning about this love, uh, about this loving father who came for me, who sent his son for me. Like, like maybe, let me say it this way, if we could figure out God in a couple of decades, he wouldn't be worth our worship. God is so much bigger and more infinite and more loving than that. And he's calling us forward. And I want to be a church that, that sees people in the Nicodemus and John 7 stage and goes, come on. Come on, let's go. Keep pressing in. Hey, can we, be, can we stop being afraid of truth? Because I, here's what's going to happen. I'm, I'm so certain of it. Is that all the other things, the questions that you have, um, like the deconstruction process that you go through, it's going to start uh, to, to like bring some walls down and bring some things down. And then one day you're going to wake up, man, and you're going to realize that Jesus was waiting right behind those walls the whole time going, hey, I'm here and I'm still good. I'm actually way more compelling than you ever even knew. So if you are in here and you got a whole lot of questions, man, ask them. Ask him, come find me. Let's create space for it. We're not trying to control the wind anymore. We're trying to catch the wind. Have you ever, like, been in a, a tough situation and get all stressed out and you just need to take a breath? Just, whew, right? It's the breath of God. It's God going, hey, I've been here from the beginning, hovering over the face of the water. I'm here with you now. I got this. Breathe, surrender, catch the wind. Finish up here. John uh, uh, keeps going. Jesus goes to the cross in John chapter 19. Uh, after the Sanhedrin, by the way, figures out a way to kill the very guy that is, is uh, trying to save them. Loves them so much. Nicodemus is sitting with the boys after it all went down. And he eventually goes, I can't be here. I can't be here. And he he leaves, and this guy named Joseph of Arimathea gets the body of Jesus. And and they take it, and he calls up Nicodemus, and he's like, hey, let's go give this guy a proper burial. And so Nicodemus, 
The guy who came to Jesus at night a couple years back, asking so many questions, going, I can't understand this whole relationship instead of religion thing, Jesus, help me. And then who was deconstructing and asking questions and trying to figure it out. It says this in John 19, he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Let me tell you why that's cool. Uh, Jewish custom was typically somebody passes away, you bring a pound of aloe, of myrrh. It helps with, with the smell. If somebody's super important and you really want to honor them, you bring five pounds. Nicodemus hears about Jesus and goes, hey, I'm, I'm on my way. I got 75. I got, I got 75 pounds. Lots of some scholars, we don't really know, but some scholars would, would put that at $100,000. Over the top, abundant generosity. The type of generosity that you can't teach, that you can't control, the type of generosity that is nothing more than an overflow of a surrendered heart. Nicodemus gets to a point where he goes, that man, that man taught me how to surrender, that man taught me how to live, that man came to save me, and so whatever I gotta do right now. And you, come on, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't sitting there going, let's see I had a pretty good year this year, made some sales. So I think if I do, I can do 75 and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, he was just like, whatever, whatever we need. Let's just go honor this man. Let's go over the top. Let's make sure we send him off right. And here's what's interesting. Nicodemus' surrender is followed two days later by resurrection. And I wonder if there's some resurrection that's waiting to happen even in this room, but the first step is surrender. Uh, I wonder if, if surrender will be followed by resurrection. Like to the, to the addict in this room who has tried everything, man. Tried everything, gone to all the, the places, talked to everybody, done everything you can, and you're about ready to give up. Can I ask you, what if, what if resurrection is gonna quickly follow your surrender? And so actually what you need to do tonight is just go, I can't do it. And that rules thing, where I try to control the wind, it doesn't work. Spirit moves in, goes, hey, we can heal. We can heal. Hey, if we believe anything, it's that resurrection comes after death. It's that surrender is followed by resurrection to the, to the couple in here, the marriage that's on the, the rocks. Can I, can, I, can I maybe just submit that resurrection might be closely followed if you just surrender? If you go, hey, I've made a lot of mistakes. Hey, I've made a lot of mistakes. Hey, hey, well, how about this? I might have been wrong. Can we try that one this week? Maybe I was wrong. Just see what happens. To the lonely teenager, resurrection follows, surrender. To the confused young adult, resurrection follows, surrender. And I'm not just saying these things because I read about it, although that's true. I'm also saying these things out of life experience. Because that brings me to two months ago. Uh, Corey and I, uh, made a trip back to, to California to the, the same spot that I broke down and cried at. And uh, we went for a week to go write some, some songs because we're weird and that's how we like to spend our vacation time. I don't know, pray for us. We're there and uh, the first like full day of writing, we spend the morning, early afternoon, like fighting for a song. We have this idea, we're writing, we're writing, we're writing. If you've ever been a part of a creative process, you know sometimes it's just a grind, man, and it's a good thing. We're fighting for it, we're fighting for it, and we finally feel like we get it about three o'clock. So we decide, hey, let's be done for the day. Let's be done for the day. Let's head down to the beach and just rest. And so we go and we don't bring a journal. We don't bring cell phones. We bring nothing. We go down to the beach and we're just trying to unplug. We're just trying to surrender. We're just trying to get some rest. And uh, I'm laying there, kind of going in and out of, of, of sleep, just enjoying the, the, the wind and the, the, the breeze and the sun and the beach. And Corey comes running up, comes running up. He's like, right. It's like, what? I got a song. So I got a song idea. And I was like, 
yeah, okay, okay, wh wh what do you got? And he's, he sings this line. And, and what, what's interesting is we've been, we've been talking for a long time about, like, what if we could just create a song that was so simple and had, like, less than 50 words? So it could just create space for people to, to heal. And he comes running up. He's like, what if we just sang, I can rest here. I can heal here. I can be at peace here. Right here in your presence. Right here in your presence. So we just kept singing that over and over and over again. And so he starts singing, he starts singing this, this melody. And we start putting these pieces together. And we're getting all excited. But remember, we don't have anything with us. And so um, inspiration kind of works. Like it, it, it comes and then it goes like, like, like the wind, right? And, and so I start, I, I get up and I take off on a sprint. And I'm going back to get the journal and a recorder while, while Corey is in the sand literally trying to write these things out in the sand. One, two, four, three. One, two, four, three. I don't get it either. He's a genius. I'm not. So I'm running. I'm sprinting. And uh, I'm like halfway there and I stop. Not because I was tired, although I was running in sand. It's not easy. I stop and I look out in the water and I realize, hey, four years ago, I was out there crying exhausted because I was trying to control the wind. Now here we are all this time later and I'm just running, trying to get my journal, trying to keep up with what God is doing, right? I'm just trying to catch the wind, not control the wind. And can I tell you, one of those things is exhausting. The other one is exhilarating. One of those things is like running on a treadmill, pushing a rock up a hill. The other is really, really fun. And uh, I share that not because I'm, I'm, I'm there yet, fully surrendered, far from it, but I'm also not where I used to be. Surrender is a lifelong process. A daily practice, waking up every morning, going, God, thank you for another day. I'm going to put my sail up today. I'm going to trust Ruach, Spirit of God, breath of God, that you're ready to take this somewhere. Like, can you imagine being a church that just puts our sail up every morning? and goes, hey, you're up to something here in Austin. We're not gonna force it. We're not gonna try to, to manufacture something and make something happen. We're just gonna put our sails up and trust spirit that you're ready to go, that you're ready to love, that you're ready to call your children home. That sounds like something I'd get behind. That sounds like a worthy cause. So uh, we thought it'd be fun to, to play that song. Uh, because it represents everything I'm trying to blabbing on up here, trying to say. Uh, it's a song about surrender and the healing that comes when we just go, hey, uh, God's here and so I'm fine. God's here and so I can rest. God's here so I can breathe. Man, like, like this might be the first deep breath people in this room have taken all week and I get it I've been there man let it be enjoy it spirit of God is here inviting you to surrender maybe for the first time maybe for the thousandth time either way the the invitation is on the table as we sing these songs so you guys stand I uh I want to try something. Um, this is an exercise uh, that I like to practice. And if this is weird for you, it's absolutely no pressure. This is your space. You do whatever you need to do. But this is an exercise I've been, I've been trying to implement into my day uh, where I just put my hands out. I just put my hands out. So if you want, if you want to join me, if you feel comfortable, if not, no, don't worry. I put my hands out and, I, and I, I just start thinking about all the things that I'm trying to control in my life. All the things that I'm trying to hold on to, whether it's this job or a relationship or a lack of relationship or wondering what the future holds or, or a, a social interaction that went wrong or whatever it is. I, I just think about those things. I just hold them right here and I just flip it over. Flip it over and I go, you know what, God? Today, I'm gonna practice 
my, my daily surrender of just letting go. And, and, and I've tried for too long to try to control the wind. Maybe it's time I just start trying to catch the wind. Maybe it's time I just go, God, what do you want to do in this place? God, what do you want to do in my life? God, what do you want to do in my soul? Because I wonder if resurrection is following quickly behind your surrender. I wonder if resurrection, if new life, if freedom is knocking on the door of your soul, pounding on the door of your soul right now, going, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready when you are. I'm ready when you are. Are you ready to let go? Are you ready to let let me be me. You ready to let me heal? Because you can heal here. You can be at peace here. You can find real life here. We can put down the religion stuff and enter into a relationship here. Because man, one of those things is exhausting. The other is absolutely exhilarating. So Father God, that's what we want in this place. That's my prayer for this church. That's my prayer for tonight, Lord, that as we sing and as we worship, Lord, would you teach us to surrender a little bit more today, Lord, a little bit more today. Would you teach us how to let go? Would you teach us how to be at peace? Would you teach us how to trust that you aren't here to condemn us, but to save us? And would that saving love change the course of our week, our life, and this church in the name of Jesus? Let's sing.